Hello, everyone. Um, I want to first thank the organizers for um, inviting me to this uh, um, really interesting workshop. So I'm Wayne Shou from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, um, pictured here. Let's see, actually, where is it? Okay. Pictured here in, at the red brick buildings, sandwiches between Mount Rainier and uh, Lake Union. So this is taken as a, 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 in a perfectly sunny and beautiful day. And normally Seattle is not like this, <laughs> but in the summer it is. <laughs> so I want to talk about win-win uh, phenotypes that emerge during the evolution of incipient cooperation. Cooperation is important in biology. I will give example of pathogenic bacteria and chrome sensing pathogenic bacteria as an example. So pathogenic bacteria can release a small compound called autoinducers. And these autoinducers can diffuse in and out of cells freely. And when the cell density is very low, nothing of great interest happens. However, when the cell density ac um, accumulates to a sufficiently high level, um, chrome sensing circuit is triggered. So basically, autoinducers activate their own synthesis and the synthesis of a battery of downstream genes, including virulence factors, including biofilm formation, or the synthesis of sca uh, nutrient scavenging molecules. And that allows this uh, pathogenic bacteria to colonize the host and to overwhelm the immune system. And this type of uh, cooperation is a homotypic cooperation because they occur between individuals of the same population. And they release basically the same benefits which can be shared by all members of the population. And in fact, if you trap a single bacterium cell in a, a small microfluidic well, this chrome sensing can also be triggered. Another type of cooperation is a heterotypic cooperation between genetically unrelated populations exchanging distinct benefits. And examples of this are numerous. For example, metabolite exchanges between different species of uh, microbes. So we want to understand how heterotypic cooperation could evolve because um, each, is, each actually population is producing a benefit for the partner rather than something that they can use themselves. So we want to ask how heterotypic cooperation might have evolved. And we want a system that is experimentally tractable. So natural co um, heterotypic cooperative systems have evolved for millions of years. And therefore, it can be challenging to trace what has happened uh, in the evolutionary process. Oh, by the way, if anybody has questions, please you know, interrupt me and ask me uh, do, do, do during the talk. That's perfectly fine. So we want a system that's experimentally tractable. We also want a system that's quantifiable and at the two levels, right? Both at the uh, level of uh, in, uh, individual cooperating partners, the properties of the two cooperating partners, because we want to understand how um, these interacting partners can generate um, behavior at the, uh, at, at the system level, the properties of the cooperative system. So we have um, constructed a, a synthetic heterotypic cooperative system called COSMO for cooperation that is synthetic and mutually obligatory. It consists of two non-mating cerevisiae strains, um, the, the budding is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The first strain is labeled with green fluorescent protein. It cannot make adenine, and it overproduces lysine. And uh, I will use this symbol. G means it's green fluorescent. The A means it requires it takes in adenine, and the L out means it releases lysine. The complementary strain is a red fluorescent um, strain that cannot make lysine, but overproduce adenine and I'll call this RLA for similar, um, sim similar notation. And the overproduced metabolites are released into the medium, potentially allowing the two types of cells to engage in self-sustainable growth. Indeed, when we mix the two types of cells in minimal medium in absence of adenine or lysine supplements, the co-culture can grow from low to high cell density, and I define that as a, a viable cooperative co-culture. And if one of the partners do not cooperate, for example, if the green strains do not overproduce lysine, or in this case, the red strain does not overproduce adenine, and then the co-culture cannot grow to high density. And I would define these as inviable co-cultures. So now with the Cosmo actually being viable, we can then ask how properties of the cooperative partners influence the behavior of the cooperative system. And the, um, the properties of cooperative partners can be measured in monocultures. For example, the growth and death rates of the two strains at the various concentrations of adenine lysine, and the rates of metabolite consumption and release. At the co-culture level, we can measure the co-culture behavior, for example, the growth rate of co-culture, or actually the viability threshold of the co-culture, and which I'll explain in a later slides. And this is, focus, uh, this is going to be focus of the remainder of my talk. 
So without going through the details, I'll just summarize to you the results from our monoculture measurements. Right? So we have this R and the G, two strains. And we do monoculture measurements. And we found that the, these red strains, when they're neutrally limited, they actually release adenine at a fixed rate. And the fixed amount of adenine is uptaken by a green cell to produce a new green cell. And uh, during the lifetime of every red cell, multiple green cells can be born. On the converse note, the death of a green cell releases a fixed amount of lysine. And a fixed amount of lysine is uptaken by the red to produce a new daughter red cell. And again, the death of one green cell can support the birth of multiple red cells. And this, this potentially allows the feed, a part of your feedback loop to kick in to allow the system to grow um, from low density to high density. And so from uh, incorporating all these measurements and other measurements, including growth and death rates, we can come up with a mathematical model that predicts this behavior. So the x-axis is the initial total cell density in logarithmic scale. So the ratio of the two actually is not that important. And then the y-axis is the fraction of viable co-cultures. So the simulations um, predicted that there exists a viability threshold. That is to say, if the total cell density goes above the viability threshold, 100% of co-cultures can be viable. And if it's uh, below the viability threshold, no co-culture can be viable. And at this boundary, at the viability threshold, sometimes co-cultures can be viable, sometimes they're inviable. And the dynamics become extremely uh, variable. And I suspect that that's a tipping point that Jeff Gore is going to talk uh, immediately after my talk. And um, so experimentally, we also observe this viability threshold. And it actually quantitatively uh, more, more or less agrees with the uh, mathematical simulations. So now that gives us a quantifiable um, system property, right? the viability threshold of the co-culture. And then we can ask, if we evolve these co-cultures, um, how this viability threshold will change? Yes. Yeah, very good question. Sorry, I should have mentioned, yes, it's in well mixed medium. That's right, that's right. Yeah, so actually the ratio is naturally not that, because, uh, not that uh, critical, because even if we started with extreme ratios, because of the supply consumption um, relationship, they will go to steady state level, which happens to be around one to one. But I, didn't, I will not have time to talk about that, that aspect in, in this talk. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And then, so we, um, we then started evolving Cosmo in uh, conditions unfavorable to cooperation. It, that's well mixed, uh, that, that question Elia just asked. So basically, we started with uh, uh, um, Cosmo co so various initial cell uh, uh, ratios, uh, 1,000 to 1, 1 to 1, 1 to 1,000. As you will see later, it's actually not that as important. So for each condition, we have uh, multiple uh, replicates, uh, three replicates in this case. And then we grow all these co constantly in well mixed environments. And that environment is predicted to be unfavorable to cooperation because if uh, you imagine a cheater variant, right, a variant of any of these that uh, do not make that much metabolites, do not overproduce metabolites, then you do not pay a cost to overproduce a metabolite. And these ones will then have fitness advantage over those ones that have not mutated. And the mutated version or the cheater version can then rise, right, can exploit the cooperative system in an unchecked manner because it's well mixed. And then these ones will quickly take over the, the, the co-culture, um, at least that's a, theor a, a theoretical prediction. So on the well-mixed co-cultures uh, as isolated populations, so it's not meta-population kind of um, experiments. So then we just wait uh, for them to grow to moderate cell density so that the cells are never limited for anything other than adenine lysine that they're supplying. So they're not limited for glucose or phosphate, or phosphate and so on and so forth. And then we dilute them, and then we repeat this process uh, again and again, round and round. So then periodically we freeze down co-cultures for future revival. And then from frozen, um, frozen Cosmo, we'll take a small, um, as a, a small sample of co-cultures and in inoculate them into minimal medium, again in the absence of adenine lysine, allow them to grow to moderate turbidity. And then we measure the viability requirement, the viability threshold of these co-cultures. It's very simple. We do that in a 96 well plate. And then we just do serial dilutions and it with each, constant, each cell density, initial cell density with multiple replicates. And after a month, we have digital readout, right? A co-culture is either viable or inviable. There's never anything between. So we can then, from this kind of experimental result, we can, uh, we can, we can measure the viability threshold. And because we're going to compare many, many of these curves, and it will be very busy to look at them. So I'm try trying to condense this curve, right? So I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees. So now the y-axis is the initial cell density, and the x-axis is the fraction of co-culture being viable. 
and I will use the box plot with the three lines indicating respectively the initial cell density at which 75%, 50%, and 25% of co-cultures are viable. So we're going to compare these positions of these box plots throughout the process of evolution. So this is a revived co-culture. So we can see that regardless of the initial um, population ratios, the co-cultures rapidly Im improved their viability. And it actually happens really fast, right? Within the first you know, 50, 30 generations, it's already an order of magnitude improvement in, in, in the viability, uh, in the viability. Because the viability threshold has been reduced by tenfold, that means the viability is improved. That means it's co-cultures, when they actually migrate to new territories, it's more likely for them to establish themselves in new territories. So now we have seen this improvement, right, in the co-cultural viability. Then we want to understand the genetic uh, mechanisms of this uh, evolutionary change. So then we um, isolate evolved clones. So I will use magenta and light green to indicate the evolved types of red and green. And then we ask who improved the co-cultural viability and how. So it is actually inst uh, uh, instructive to think ahead of time, think about what possible evolutionary outcomes we might expect, right? So suppose we have uh, ancestral red and green evolved to uh, this magenta and the uh, light green. So if we mix evolved green with ancestral red, if we observe increase in co-cultural viability, that means that evolved green has contributed to improvements in co-cultural viability. And conversely, if we do this, if we see this, then this one is a culprit, or at least contributes to that. And then we can imagine uh, a mutant can have self-serving changes, right? For example, you have increased affinity for metabolites, which will help yourself to survive, which makes co-culture survive better, or increased starvation tolerance. Alternatively, you can also have a partner-serving phenotype, which is that you, if you increase uh, the metabolite supply that can help partner, which will indirectly, uh, eventually will benefit yourself because your partner then does better and then you yourself do better. Of course, we can also imagine partner-specific co-evolution if we uh, mix evolved green and red together, right? And if they have developed some affinity, then if we mix the evolved with the ancestors, there should be no increase in co-cultural viability because they need to be with the evolved partner, co-evolved partner rather than with ancestor. Right? So we anticipate these types of change. So we want to see if in the replicate co-cultures, What's the diversity in evolutionary trajectories of an incipient cooperative system? So again, um, this is ancestral co-culture, right? It's about 20,000 um, cells per mil. It's required for 50% of viability. And for this, it's just revived co-culture, right? It has improved uh, uh, ten about tenfold. And then if we mix evolved red with ancestral green, we see that the viability has improved uh, more or less to comparable level. If we mix the evolved uh, green with ancestral red, um, that improvement is not that dramatic. So that uh, says that the, red, the evolved red is more or less sufficient to drive this improvement in viability. And this is pattern is kind of cons rather consistent, at least through the early stages of evolution. At later stage, something more interesting happens. But that won't be the topic of this, uh, of this talk. So we then just fo um, focus on these evolved red. And we just, uh, we just isolate them and do whole genome resequencing, which, uh, which is becoming really trivial for yeast now. And so basically, these are evolutionary lines in the different generations and clone numbers. And uh, these are the mutations that we have found, right? So for most of the clones, they either have the mutation in a gene called ECM21 or a gene called RSP5. And because yeast is such a well-studied organism, so it's very easy for us to look into literature and find out what they do, right? So ECM21 and RSP5 actually are in the pathway in which I will describe to you now. So um, LIP1 is a high affinity permease for lysine. And under stressful conditions, for example, neutron limitation conditions encountered in this cooperative environment, ECM21 adapter attracts, um, recruits RSP5 E3 uh, ligates in conjunction with E2 enzyme, transfers ubiquitin chain to, uh, to uh, the permease. And once it's uh, ubiquitinated, the uh, permease is then inter uh, internalized and targeted for vacuolar degradation after this uh, ubiquitin is recycled. So now imagine if you have mutations in ECM21 or RSP5, then you would imagine the, the permeates will be stabilized on the cell surface. And uh, to verify that, so we tag the lip one with green fluorescent protein uh, in the uh, lysine requiring cells, either in ancestral state or the evolved state. So in ancestor, the, uh, uh, the lip one is actually uh, mainly in um, a vacuole, but then there's the also some membrane localization. And in uh, evolved ones, they're all in the membrane. Right, it's consistent with uh, what we, uh, our fun the known functions of ECM21 and RSP5. So if that's the case, we would expect the evolved ones would be much better at growing in the low concentrations of lysine than ancestor. 
And we did this uh, measurement. So the, the growth rate is a function of limiting lysine concentration. And uh, note that the scale is broken, so we just right, so we can span a larger dynamic range. And at the low concentration of lysine, which is cosmos below two micromolar, I mean concentration of lysine below two micromolar, the so evolved ones in orange and blue grow much faster than the ancestor in black. Right, and, and then this kind of improvement in growth on a limited concentration of lysine is, has a trade-off at a high concentration. They don't grow as well. That explains why they're not very abundant at the beginning of the experiment. So we have to select for it. So now that then we ask, uh, because adenine overproduction is costly, we, uh, we want to know whether these can also have self-serving changes right, through a reduction in adenine release. So we measure the release rate. And to our great surprise, the evolved ones actually release adenine at a faster rate than the ancestor. And for the case of RSP5, it's three times as fast, and ECM21 is about twice as fast. So that's rather surprising to us, right? Because we are evolving this cooperative system in a condition well mixed, right? So it's basically encouraging the fastest growing individual, which is supposed to be purely self serving. But we see this actually partner serving uh, phenotype. Are these mutations back in, or are those. Uh, uh, no, these ones are evolved strains uh, containing ECM21 RSP5 mutants. There could be other. Yes, we are actually doing the sufficiency experiments now. But yes, that it's, it's, it's possible. And so now our hypothesis is that, that actually these, these mutants will probably also stabilize the FCY2. So that is a purine cytosine permease. And adenine is a, you know, it's a purine. So from now on, I will just call FCY2 as adenine permease for the purpose of this talk. So perhaps the FCY2 stabilizes such that, um, such that adenine will, the inside adenine can go out. So we tested this hypothesis. We labeled FCY2 with a green fluorescent protein. In the ancestor, again, FCY2 is in the vacuum in the cell membrane. And as ECM21 mutants, it's stabilized uh, partially on the membrane, and RSP5 is completely stabilized. So it's actually even consistent with the, the, the uh, two-fold improvement uh, in release in ECM21 and higher the three-fold improvement in RSP5. So then if, we, if that's the case, if we remove FCY2, right, then what happens is that this increase in release is actually mostly abolished, suggesting FCY2 is the uh, major permease media used to release this extra uh, adenine. But interestingly, the ancestor doesn't make any difference. Right? So, so, so that suggests the ancestor is using some other permease uh, to release adenine. So, um, so now we have this hypothesis, right? Pliotropy can create win-win phenotypes in the evolution of an incipient cooperative system. So what, what, what that is is that for ECM21 RSP5 actually targets multiple permeases, including lysine permease LIP1 and, uh, and the purine permease FCY2. Right, under stressful conditions, normally these will be degraded. And if they're degraded, then, uh, then, then the cells can just cannot grow. But in evolved cells, um, these are actually are mutated. So that leads to the stabilization of both the LIP1 permease and the, uh, the FCY2 permease. And the stabilization of LIP1 permeates allows the extracellular lysine to be imported uh, with much greater efficiency into the cell, and that is a self-serving change. Right? And the stabilization of FCY2 allows accumulated overproduced adenine to go outside, and that is a partner-serving partner change. And what's mainly selected for the self-serving change, and this is just a pliotropic side effect of this uh, self-serving change. And so then if that's the case, then we would expect that uh, we would expect we should see similar changes in monocultural evolution, so selecting purely for adaptation for lysine limitation. So we repeated this evolution experiment um, of actually just only monocultures in chemostat. So chemostat is a really, really neat de device, right? It's a very collaborative design um, back in the, 50s, uh, in the 50s. So basically, you have a cultural reservoir, right? And then you have a stir bar, you know, or a stir plate. It stirs um, the, this, uh, um, this medium containing cells. And it's, uh, it's uh, the pump. It will pump the limited uh, lysine at the limited concentration into, the, into this uh, cultural vessel. And any overflow will just be discarded. So you can achieve this uh, steady state level. And at the steady state level, cell growth rate is controlled by pump rate. And that's the, the, the beauty of this method, right? You can actually tune the growth rate by tuning the pump rate. So we actually, we actually set the pump rate to so that the monoculture grows at the same rate as the co-cultures. Right, it co-culture for example, they double every ten hours, and this, in this we also let them double every ten hours, so they are experiencing more or less the same lysine limitations. And then we isolate clones, and then we ask whether these also have gain, have also acquired the win-win phenotypes. In the co-culture, we can kind of infer from the growth rate. 
from the growth rate, if the, the, the KM, if we have evolved the cells, we, we know the uh, growth rate and different concentrations of, uh, on the different concentrations of, uh, um, of uh, on the different concentrations of lysine. So, and for the chemostatic, actually we do not know. All we do is that, uh, so basically, the, okay, so the second effect, which Jeff just mentioned, so I will just uh, finish the loop. So actually the two things you control. The first thing is uh, the pump rate, which you control the growth rate. The second thing you control the concentration of lysine. In this, in this, and this controls the final density, right? So higher amount of lysine, uh, the higher amount of lysine concentration here is, the more the, the higher steady state level is. So whatever the growth rate is still controlled by the concentration of the lysine in the medium, which is, we cannot measure. It's below the way, below the level of at least a bioassay detection level uh, using the ancestral cells as a, as a strain. So then we, so after ev ev evolving for you know tens of generations, we isolate these clones, and then we ask whether these whether these have you know, win-win phenotypes, right? Whether they also help partner, even though the partner is never actually in the, in the, in the environment. So again, okay, so this is the KN, right? So this is the, uh, sorry, this is growth rate as a function of lysine concentration. And these are the, the black, again, the ancestor, and the green and the purple are the evolved isolates. Right, so again, on the low concentration of lysine below two micro, uh, uh, micromolar, the evolved ones grow better than the ancestor. So that's a self-serving. And then if we do adding release, and these ones also release more than the, the, than the partner. And then furthermore, it's not as a unit. So these ones seem to be more uh, similar, and these ones seem to be far away, although I'm not, yeah, at least at this concentration. But this is, a, is, a, is consistent with the fact that actually adding overproduction is not under selection. And therefore, you would expect more, perhaps more variations in the inner population. So actually, pryotropy has actually been shown to stabilize homotypic cooperation. Kevin Foster has done really beautiful work in um, in dicticillium, but in a, a more uh, in a more recent example using Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the, the pathogenic bacteria engaged in quorum sensing, which I talked uh, talked about at the very beginning of my talk. So I'll just use that as an example. So quorum sensing, right? Look for uh, like for example, we have these cells, and we know quorum sensing controls a battery of downstream genes, and these, of course, including the production of common goods, right? The goods are released into environment, for example, extracellular proteases that you can di digest the proteins, and the transfer pro uh, transform proteins into um, amino acids, which can be uptaken by the cells. But also it controls the production of private goods, right? Which is ad adenosine hydrolase. So if you cheat, for example, if you do not engage in quorum sensing, you, you, you of course you do not pay the cost of making common goods, but you also, in some sense, punish in the sense that you cannot utilize ad adenosine as well. So this kind of prior to be the, the coupling of self-interest, right? And the, the, the common interest is actually coupled uh, in the quorum sensing through prior to be. And so pryotropy, the, 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 the phenomenon of one gene controlling multiple pheno phenotypes is actually very common. For example, this is a, a map of protein interaction that works in cerevisia. You, you can see many, many genes are highly, highly connected. So it's actually not surprising to generate the uh, pryotropic effect. So, but we um, argue pryotropy can create win-win phenotypes, right, which couples um, the self-win with the partner win. So one might ask, how easily can pro-cooperation pleiotropy arise, right? So one possibility is that you can rewire networks to create pleiotropy to stabilize cooperation, right? And alternative, alternatively, pre-existing pleiotropy can already serendipitously stabilize cooperation. And our work suggests that this actually can happen, actually rather easily. And then um, incipient heterotypic cooperation, even under evolution, I mean, uh, even under conditions not favorable to cooperation, right? It can still generate women phenotypes because of this pleiotropic effect. So I just want to, um, so self win again is directly selected for, and the partner win is a, is a side effect, which is expected to go away if we evolve this for a longer period of time in well-mixed co uh, cultures. So I just want to uh, acknowledge the members of my lab. This, one is mainly, uh, this project was mainly done by Chi Chen Chen, a very talented uh, research tech in my lab. And then with the undergraduate Jose Pineda and another research tech, uh, Eric Kapo, and Barbara Momeni did some modeling. And Adam Witt provided uh, um, this, the sequencing information analysis um, software. And then my, the, my, my labs are funded by these uh, generous uh, foundations. So thank you very much. I would entertain <laughs> questions.
Okay, I will. Maybe I'll just exit. Yeah, so let me just, yeah. I, oh, yeah. Let's say 100 of the same generation. Right. The green bar, there seem to be the validity uh, threshold is not improved, right? Only next one of the uh, Yeah, it, there's some variability. Um, there's more variability. I, we didn't notice that, and we're actually pursuing that. It's rather interesting to us. So initially, at least for the red, actually, let me see. It's similar. I mean, the sample size is small, but for the limited ones, we see we actually see a wider uh, variability in the in, in the red string. The green, um, I, the green. So there's an actual intrinsic difference between the red and the green. And then we, what do we feel is that because these, so the adding and requiring and the lysine requiring cells are highly asymmetric because if cells don't have lysine, they die very fast. But if they don't have adenine, they can survive for quite a long period of time. Presumably because there are many different forms of adenosine, for example, ATP, AMP, DATP, DAM, uh, DADP. So there are many, many forms of uh, adenosine. So maybe they have a higher, you know, my hypothesis is there's a higher um, reservoir of uh, adenosine or adenosine without NAD, right? All this, all this. So then these ones uh, probably are not under as much selective pressure as the, 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 the lysine requiring ones, which they actually they don't have lysine, they really, I mean, besides for the vacuolar storage, they really have not nowhere to, to, to go. So that's, a, that's what I think is the difference in the, uh, in the, the, in the asymmetric contribution to the, uh, to the rest. So if a red improves a little bit, that already is a huge change to the co-culture viability. But if it's green, it's hard to improve, and if it improves very much, because that's not as, as a red limiting as a red. Right. Yes, yes. So the earlier ones, maybe not have this. So earlier ones, they are more genotype, also more, uh, more, more uniform, because actually I didn't show all these ones, right? other mutations. So, so as, as later you go, the more mutations they, uh, they, they accumulate. Like, but it's a variable. Like this one <coughs> has three and five, right? Three synonymous, and the, the five uh, non synonymous. And this one has, and this is all from 76th generation. So there's a more and more vari variability in the. In the Genetic diversity becomes more variable, right? Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I we have not tested that. We have not tested that. We have not tested. It. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so, the, so adenine usually, I mean, so also actually, I, I didn't mention that in my talk, right? So overproduction, why would they overproduce? Actually, normally they don't overproduce because the first enzyme in the biosynthetic pathway, actually of all, all the pathways I have read in the literature, right? The first enzyme is always on the end product feedback inhibition control. So once the cells have enough, they shut down the, fir the first, and it's very efficient, it's always the first one. And that's actually why the, metabol uh, the metabolite overproduction actually has, evo from an evolution point of view, has a, a cost. Because normally they just they have already you know, evolved to, to not overproduce. So normally actually they don't have much in the in in the um, in the cell, so they don't actually go out. But in this case, they are, I mean, I made a mutation so that the end product is no longer sensitive. I mean, so the, the first enzyme is no longer sensitive to end product feedback inhibition control. That's why they're massively overproducing. But now that you have concentration gradient, because outside there's not much adenine, and the inside there's a huge amount of adenine. And the permeate is basically, it's bi-directional. Yeah, actually, actually, it's not quite, it's so that's not quite accurate either, because actually, even though it's called permease, it doesn't directly use ATP, but it uses the proton, um, proton um, gradient, because the yeast actually, when they grow, they make the acidified environment. And then the proton actually, when the proton goes from outside to inside, this, these other, these other uh, metabolites can go against concentration gradient. So that's why lysine can go in. But for in this case, adenine, I assume it because inside is higher than outside. So it's actually, even without this uh, proton gradient, it can go outside. Right, so. Yes. Uh, yes, we have tried it. Then that's uh, the experiment I showed. Because if you don't let them overproduce, they don't grow. The co culture just do not even grow. Yeah, yeah, no matter, uh, no, no matter, I mean, as far as, uh, uh, you know, so that, that is, uh, okay, so that is this, um, this one. 
actually, this is very different from bacteria. It looks, it, people have done this for bac uh, oxytrophic bacteria strain. For some combinations, you don't actually need to in, uh, introduce overproduction. You just mix them together, like isoleucine or leucine, oxytrophin. You mix them together, you can actually already grow. But for this, it seems to me it's a tighter control. So if I, here, if, you know, if green is not overproducing lysine and the cocoa just, this is just residual growth. They're using up whatever the vacuola store just so you can grow a little bit, but then even eventually they just don't, the cocoa culture cannot never grow to high density. I can wait forever, right? And eventually the whole cocoa culture just dies. Oh, so and here it's, oh, different concentrations. Yeah. Okay, so actually we have a, some mathematical derivation shows that like the overall supply must exceed the overall consumption. So if you don't do that, you will never, you will never satisfy that uh, the basic supply consumption requirement. So we have actually mixed them at a quite high density, but not just at the one to one ratio. At, and then they just do not grow. And eventually just everybody dies. Yeah. I was wondering about the generalizability of this to other organisms. <laughs> uh, more, more specifically, right. um, so let me focus the question a little bit. Are there features of the organisms you, you use that you think are particularly responsible for the behavior you yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so actually, the, the um, RSP5, that central regulator, actually regulates a lot of, lot of permits. So in this case, it's not that, it's not that uh, you know, surprising sometimes. But there's a, one, one strain I didn't talk about, one mutant I didn't talk about. This one, we cannot find any ECM21 mutant or RSP5. We don't have, we find nothing. We're actually still trying to figure out whether some, whether some trans, you know, translocation or something. Right? It's nothing. I mean, we can detect, not detect any SNPs in that, right? So it's definitely not in the known pathway of ECM21. That one also has pleiotropic effect. They also overproduce more and take up more. So I don't know whether it's the yeast or not, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how general it is, right? But at least in this case, you have multiple ways of achieving this pleiotropy. Some involves the central regulator RSP5, and some regulate some other mysterious things that we're still trying to track down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go. Uh, destabilizing these in I mean, the wild type. Oh, that's okay. I, I understand the physio. Yes, that's actually a good question. So what? So so actually, uh, uh, Mark Babst did a really beautiful piece of um, series of work. So what they showed under these stressful conditions, right? If you do not, if you do not internalize the 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 the, 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 tr the transporters then there's less amino acid to be recycled from degradation of the transporters. So actually cells die really quickly. So they're caught both ways, right? So if they don't do it, right. if, if there's nothing out there, then they're stuck with these useless permeates that are not doing anything. And they cannot recycle these amino acids, right? right? And if there's, a, there's a too much, actually if there's too much nutrients, they also turn it down because then it becomes toxic. These high affinity permeates, if the concentration is too high, they also turn it down. So there's a really nice nonlinear kind of relationship, right? So if it's too low, it's off. Too high, it's off. In the mid, in the middle, it's stabilized. Well, all the amino acids. Acid. That I can never say all, oh. uh, but I say oh. <laughs> many ones. Because for the FCY2, they never said it, it, it was a, the substrate, and we looked at it was a substrate. But it is known for many transport, many permeases. It's it, it's regulated under under stressful conditions. It's it's regulated by the RSP. Um, uh, if, so you're saying if you have a mixture of amino acids in a medium, right, and if one's lacking and it needs that one, right, it would, it would destabilize. Yeah, I, I believe it's actually pretty general. Yes, it will, it will destabilize. I mean, it, it will destabilize all permeases. Oh, the deep sequencing. Oh, sorry. So basically, what do we do is that now, like Illumina, deep, um, we use Illumina machine, so we actually can see the sequence for these strains in one lane. So basically, we just uh, you know chop up the DNA uh, and then do this. Oh, we isolated. Actually, we isolate isolates. We grow them up. Uh, you know, grow them up to high density, and then we then do whole genome music. and then we compare evolved with ancestor. And all the SNPs we saw were the, were the ones and that's in there. you found all the SNPs in full? Oh, no, no, for some, for early generations, yeah, okay, so it depends. For late generations, a lot more. But early generations, um, early generations, we find it like not so many. And uh, the, okay, so the, uh, um, 
So for example, in the early generations, right, so we, so like for example, this one we find the ECM21 doesn't stop, this glutamic acid 316 mutated to stop, and we find another one that's synonymous on in non-coding region. Like this one, we only find this. But in for so this, this is we, yes, for the early, but for the late ones, there are more. But uh, we are not I'm, not, I'm not claiming I'm finding everything. Because clearly there are, there are for example, this mutant definitely has heritable phenotypes, right? So we cannot find anything. But could it be translocation, which our software, if anybody actually had an idea of how to like really high efficiently find translocations or immersions, right? Uh, let me know. So far, <laughs> so far all my colleagues also say we cannot capture these, major, um, these other changes, which are translocations and inversions, which when you map to the reference sequence, it just doesn't map. These reads just don't map to the reference you sequence. Have experience, uh, you guys uh, published you know, in supplementary materials, you know, they submitted you guys. Yeah, no, we have not submitted. This one is actually, um, it's, still, it's still work in progress. <laughs> we have not submitted this yet, yeah. Yeah, we should, I should turn the podium over to Jeff. Thanks.